Hi everyone, I'm Robert McGinnis. I'm the H-Tech race car driver. I race the number 95 Turner BMW uh, M4 GT4 race car. Uh, today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, technology, data, motorsport, um, and we're gonna tie it into, you know, what uh, Yvonne and, uh, what Yvonne has to talk about in automotive as a whole. So, thanks for having me guys. Awesome. Okay. Uh, my name is Ivan Popovic. I'm Director of Engineering and Delivery in HTEC, and I'm leading the uh, automotive portfolio in HTEC. Uh, so what I wanted to uh, talk about today is how the uh, technology influenced the automotive industry throughout the history. And when uh, people uh, say technology, I think uh, majority of people immediately think about the AI or uh, think about some um, uh, maybe ADAS part and how it's influencing today. But I would like to take a long path through the history uh, at the beginning of everything. So Sean, just flip the, the slide uh, and uh, to see how everything started. So basically, uh, since the dawn of man, uh, people were trying to uh, increase uh, the actually to uh, change the way how they are traveling and change the way how they are uh, transporting goods. And uh, if we look at the history, so the uh, first uh, origins of the wheel are 3500 BC in Mesopotamia. So that's uh, like five and a half thousand years from, <laughs> from now. And why I call this era reinventing the wheel, because for almost 4000 years, nothing changed. So uh, the chariots and, and carriages were invented just a few hundred years back to, to the first dated wheel. And then the improvements that were made uh, were the hollow wheel uh, around 2000 BC. And afterwards, uh, there was another uh, improvement with uh, putting the iron coil, uh, iron coil around the, the wheel. And this was it. And basically until uh, industrialization uh, became popular and, and started gaining momentum throughout the Europe and US. There were no major changes in the way how people are traveling or how the uh, uh, how the, the goods are transported. Uh, everything changed somewhere, started actually changing somewhere in the 17th century uh, with the uh, expansion of the coal mines and the coal uh, in the, the mining industry. And this actually uh, paved the road towards the uh, 18th century uh, or the train century, because a lot of improvements were made in, uh, in 18th century when it comes to the trains and the transportation and the steam engine. And up to 19th century, uh, there was, uh, beside this, there were no big changes when it comes to the uh, uh, transportation uh, and uh, in 18th and 19th century, there were actually also uh, tries uh, uh, to use the steam engine for the vehicles outside of the railroad tracks. But of course, they were not very efficient. So this approach was abandoned. And this is why uh, I think uh, if you look at this list of things and you notice the year uh, when it starts, this is why I think that we live in a very, very interesting time because we are speaking now about the, the last 150 uh, years and all the improvements that we have with the cars and the uh, 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 transportation are actually from this era. And uh, with even bigger accent and the bigger leap that happened in the last like 20 years. So uh, in 1886, uh, the, the internal combustion engine was invented earlier, but the, the start date of automotive is taken to be 18, uh, 1886 when Carl Benz uh, produced the first car. It had three wheels and it was like first serial model that was that was made. And this spread uh, across the, the, the continent and then to the US as well. And uh, what also was worth mentioning at that time is the Ford Model T. The Ford Model T was a four wheel drive and it uh, it reached uh, a whooping 20 uh, i think 45 miles per hour uh, at that point it had 20 horsepowers uh, and what is interesting is the way how henry ford approached the assembling of the uh, model t 
and this actually uh, created a ground for the mass production, a real mass production of the cars in, in the history. And uh, there was one important uh, uh, addition to the car in 1911, which was uh, electric ignition starter. So you, you didn't have to uh, take the, the cram and, and to, <laughs> to turn it to turn on the, your car. And basically, if you notice, there is a gap between 1911 and 1930. And of course, the reason was the World War I, which uh, directed most of the technology and industry towards the, unfortunately, uh, military part. And there were not many inventions or not many pushes when it comes to the transportation. But in 1930, there was one, uh, uh, inf the first infotainment uh, breakthrough What was the car radio. Uh, it was actually uh, AM radio and it took like 20 or 30 years more to get the uh, stereo FM radios in the cars. Uh, and th then people started thinking uh, when the cars at that point between the two world wars became uh, a little bit more accessible to, to a larger audience. Uh, uh, engineers started thinking how to increase the commodity when you're driving. And this is how the coil spring suspension was added in 1933 and uh, 1934. And basically first it was mounted on the front wheels and then afterwards it was on all wheels. And then the uh, the driving became a little bit more relaxing. So there were some uh, minor changes to the car in this period. But again, there was a, a second world war. And uh, again, uh, the investments in this industry were uh, put to a halt uh, until the end of the World War II. And in 1949, car keys were, uh, let's say, added. Uh, the, the universal car that can open the door of the car, lock and unlock the car and start the engine. So this was a huge uh, thing at that time. Uh, and uh, this next decade, uh, I like to call the Chrysler decade because most of the things that came, came from Chrysler. So the power steering was introduced in 1951, air conditioning in uh, 1958, and of course the cruise control in 58 as well. Then in 1959, uh, Volvo as the pioneer of safety, uh, uh, which became, I think, their trademark throughout the, the whole history of the, the OEM, uh, introduced uh, seat belts uh, to help save lives. And the interest, interesting thing is that uh, actually they gave this patent for free, so all other OEMs can uh, install it to save more lives. In 60s, we got electric windows, and this is where the uh, the influence of the consumer uh, industry started um, uh, on the automotive industry. And with the development of electronics, we got the electric windows, we got intermittent windshield wipers, and in the 70s, the uh, cassette tape stereos arrived. So I don't know if there are a lot of people on the call, so I don't know how old are you, but I do remember the cassette tape stereos in the in the cars. Uh, in 1974, again, one of the uh, initial breakthroughs was the digital dashboard. So that uh, that it was the I think on the Lotus. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it was on Lotus. Uh, it had the first onboard computer. It had the temperature uh, sensors. Uh, it had, uh, I think, some even uh, diagnostics on it. Uh, in, 18, uh, in 1984, uh, CD players arrived in the car, so another big step for the infotainment. Uh, in 1988, the airbags. Uh, in 1991, uh, electromagnetic parking sensors were added. Uh, OBD as a standard was introduced uh, in 1994, and actually the, the standard was uh, uh, originated from Ford, and they used it in their factories in the uh, in the 80s. Uh, but it became a de facto standard somewhere around 1994, and afterwards it uh, it was a mandatory thing to have in uh, both uh, first in US and then in uh, in uh, Europe as well. In 1996, there was the first. This is the era. Uh, of the uh, connectivity and the telco industry when uh, when the telco started gaining momentum 
uh, and uh, the first connected car uh, project was from the General uh, Motor, uh, General Motors, and basically uh, it allowed uh, you to uh, dial 911 in case of the accident. So this was the the first uh, connected car project uh, that was uh, that was there. In uh, 2000, uh, the GPS navigation was introduced. Uh, and uh, the reason why it wasn't introduced before, for instance, is that uh, U.S. military in, in U.S. U.S. military scrambled the, the signal, so it was not uh, not available for the the widespread usage. So, uh, and uh, uh, one very important milestone was the hybrid cars, uh, Toyota with Prius. Uh, basically, the, the idea of the hybrid cars is much older. It's about 100 years old at that point. And then Toyota picked it up and made it a, a, a reality. Uh, in 2001, again, the, the telco and radio part, the Bluetooth was introduced. In 2002, reversing cameras. In 2003, automatic parking. And then, in uh, some starting from some 20, uh, 2010, uh, we started receiving various ADAS uh, features uh, inside of the car. Uh, in 2014, the Tesla launched its autopilot. Uh, and uh, one important thing that also happened at that time was the uh, 4G Wi Fi hotspot in the car. And in 2020, uh, there was a first successful, uh, uh, let's say, uh, autonomous drive by Waymo. Uh, and uh, in 2023, which is not on the slide, uh, officially the commercial OEM reached the L3 level of the autonomy on the roads. Uh, I would just like to point one more thing, which is not on the slide. And I know that a lot of people don't know the fact, but uh, electric vehicles are actually older than the internal combustion ones. Uh, the in beginning of the 19th century, somewhere around 1820, uh, there was a first electric motor mounted on the carriage. So there was like a, an electric carriage, uh, but the first true electric car came in uh, 1888, just two years after the first true car. But since the limitations of the technology and the batteries at that time, this approach was abandoned uh, until it gained momentum in the past uh, period again. Uh, Sean, please, uh, next slide. So how the present looks like, and when I say present, uh, I think the uh, this year. So what's going to be a, a hot topic in development? Uh, there are like if you read the uh, analysis from uh, different sources, you, you will most probably have these four always uh, uh, put uh, on various places uh, or there, there are some others, but I think that these four are actually going to be this year quite actual. Uh, the first one is, of course, the continuation of development of the electric vehicles and the ecosystem surrounding them. So from the electrical chargers, either wireless or wired, the whole um, enterprise system that, that lay beyond this. Uh, the, the second part is again going to be increasing the connectivity, utilization, higher utilization of the con connectivity, which is uh, tightly coupled with the self-driving vehicles and higher levels of autonomy, because there is a need for a lot of data transfers uh, on the self-driving vehicles or the higher level autonomy vehicles and some of the data they need to receive uh, in close to real time, not in real time, but close to in the real time. And they also need to send some data. So basically these two areas are coupled. And of course, the as I mentioned, the self-driving vehicles and higher autonomy levels. So uh, since the uh, th it is going to continue uh, this year and probably next few years, there's going to be an increase in, in development in these areas because uh, um, I mentioned that last year there was a, an official license in US uh, uh, granted for the L3 level of the autonomy, but not all the OEMs have it. So they are going to pick up the pace most probably and uh, go with, uh, with L3. Uh, and of course, the mobility as a service is connected with the self-driving vehicles and we have, you have uh, 
few companies in the world that are already spearheading this uh, this initiative, and I'm also expecting that this is going to increase in the following years. And the reasons I put HTEC in uh, in in center of all of it is because we are working on all of these projects. Uh, we are really trying to keep uh, the the pro projects interesting and to be on the edge of technology. So uh, just as a a little bit of fourth size uh, slide uh, and to, to tickle the imagination of, of the people present here. Uh, I would like to give my view on what will be the next quantum leap in the, in the uh, automotive industry. And uh, I would like to take out the uh, legislation part or the commercial part uh, and just to, to put the pure imagination here in, uh, in, in, uh, in place. So I believe that there are uh, like two most common directions that I, I think the most people are also expecting to see. One is on the propulsion side and one is on the AI side. Uh, Toyota is heavily investing in hydrogen engines and this might be the next uh, the next big thing, uh, if the elect because electric vehicles they have good sides, but they also have bad sides. If we want to be fair and honest, and uh, if the technology doesn't support uh, the battery utilization of the energy in the electric cars, easier, uh, bet uh, different type of batteries, uh, and uh, some other things. Uh, maybe the hydrogen engines are going to take the, the primate in the, in the future. Uh, it doesn't have to be the, the hydrogen. The, there are some other crazy ideas uh, about uh, uh, some other sorts of, of uh, propulsions, uh, but I don't wish to go there because it's on the border with, with the science fiction. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the AI, uh, one of the I had an interesting discussion with uh, one of the uh, senior uh, people from NVIDIA, I think two or three years ago, uh, where we discussed the utilization of the computer vision inside of the vehicles. And uh, one thing that he said is that the next quantum leap that the, everybody's waiting there is the easier way to train the neural networks because uh, everybody who's involved in working with machine learning and AI and uh, everything, uh, uh, everything connected to the automotive and these two topics knows that you need uh, a very big data sets in order to train the network and to verify them. Uh, theoretically, for instance, in the computer vision area, it is it will be possible uh, to train the for instance, the, the object recognition only based on one image. So if we achieve this and get to this point or the people which are developing this, I think that there's going to be a huge, huge uh, uh, quantum leap in automotive as well, because it's going to make it much more easier to train the networks and to utilize these networks. And of course, the, uh, uh, we are still mainly using machine learning in, in automotive. Uh, deep learning is not utilized as much and most probably there's going to be increase and uh, some of the things might be resolved with utilization of deep learning or federated learning uh, in automotive. And the third direction, which I put in the middle of these two, is uh, uh, the one which might uh, uh, which is really a science fiction one. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, in, in domains of organic technology and biotech. So if you're a, a science fiction fan as myself, you probably heard about organic technology and <laughs> the ways to utilize it. But I don't think that it's still uh, much present in, in the reality. But uh, you can imagine, for instance, that you have um, coating, I cannot say a paint, but a coating on your car, which is going to self heal uh, in case it is damaged. Uh, and this can be applied for some other parts of the car to actually be able to self heal, regenerate uh, or adapt to the, the surroundings or adapt to the weather conditions. 
And uh, the, the second uh, area of technology that might bring the next quantum leap is a biotech. With biotech, uh, uh, there are already some, uh, biotech is still young and uh, there, there's been a lot of experiments in this domain, for instance, uh, uh, one thing that caught my eye was the uh, moving of, uh, of the prosthetic uh, limbs uh, by utilizing the alpha waves of the, the human brain. And the same thing uh, can be uh, applied maybe in uh, our automotive industry to wirelessly monitor. I, I think that there, there, there were some articles I read that they're trying actually to wirelessly monitor the, uh, the uh, brain activity. Uh, of the driver in order to warn him uh, on uh, if he's losing the focus or he's doing it more automatically than uh, he should. And the second level would uh, uh, is going again a little bit towards the science fiction is to actually use the readings from uh, uh, brain waves to control the vehicle. Uh, this is a little bit uh, in contrary with the self-driving vehicles, but actually uh, it will take uh, a lot of time if we are following ISO 26262 uh, to reach the the L5 uh, because the standards are very strict uh, in uh, in this domain so maybe this will be the answer to make a, uh, a little bit of different branching when it comes to the uh, next uh, next big thing in the in the uh, automotive industry and automotive world and with this, I'm stopping. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, there will be enough time for, for Robert to, to also present his part. Yes, thank you, Ivan. Um, so now that we've heard kind of where, where we have come from and sort of what the potential futures hold in the, in the especially the science fiction stuff, that was super interesting. Uh, Robert, why don't you talk to us a little bit about What's happening now, and and what the what kind of data technology is embedded in the cars you get to drive every day um, that we uh, never get to drive? Awesome. Yes, I would love to. Let me just share my screen here quickly. Um, all right. Awesome. So, yes, like I introduced myself before, I'm Robert McGinnis. I'm the H Tech race car driver. Really excited to talk to everyone today. Um, I'm going to start by giving you just some quick background and then we'll go into the technology that goes into these super fast race cars and you know what it takes to, to win races. So just to give you some quick background, I race in IMSA. Um, for those of you who've watched the movie Ford versus Ferrari, um, that is the type of racing that I do. It's all of the biggest car manufacturers in the world creating race cars based off their road cars and competing against one another in some of the biggest, hardest, most prestigious and longest races in the world. Some quick background on myself. So I started racing at eight years old in go-karts. Um, you know, I moved up the ranks in go-karts to when I was 15, I got scouted by uh, an open wheel IndyCar race team. I moved into their junior car uh, the F1600, Formula 1600 race car at 15 years old. That car goes about 145 miles an hour. I moved up the ranks through IndyCar to eventually be able to race with Andretti Autosport. Um, for those of you who've heard of Michael and Mario Andretti, they're racing legends. And at 19, 20, 21, I got to race with them in this Indy Lights car that goes 215 miles an hour. And you know, after doing well, I was able to transition that into a contract with Lamborghini uh, at 22 years old. I had a great year with Lamborghini and I was able to move on to BMW last year and this season. So these are the teams I'm racing with now. So in 2024, um, I and HTEC will be racing with BMW, with Turner Motorsport, with McGinnis Motorsport. BMW is the manufacturer that creates this amazing race car that I get to drive. Um, Turner Motorsport is the North American team that runs this car. Engineers, trucks, pit crew, strategists, they all come from Turner. And then McGinnis Motorsport is our family racing business that allows myself and my brother George to, to go racing. 
So that's just some quick background on you know myself and my racing career, but I really want to talk to you about technology and racing, right? And today I want to really focus on you know how is technology accelerating change in the automotive industry, right? Technology is a huge part of racing, right? If you look how motorsport has changed in the last 10, 15 years, it's changed from who cares the least about crashing the, their race car and hurting themselves to, you know, who can analyze data the quickest, who can make decisions on the fly and who can use technology to be as perfect as possible, as fast as possible, every single corner every single lap. Everything that happens in and around our race cars are measured and recorded. There's so much technology in the race car to keep us safe, to allow us to make adjustments, to allow us to you know, get the most out of our car and our performance as a team. And technology doesn't just happen on the racetrack, it happens, it's around us every day and allows us to go and win. And a big part of the way that technology helps us is with our preparation, right? So technology allows us to prepare and preparation is the most important thing. When you show up at the racetrack, you want to be 90, 95% of the way there, right? If you show up behind the eight ball, it's going to be impossible to catch up. And racing is kind of a weird sport. If you're a soccer player, you go outside, you kick a soccer ball around all day. If you're a race car driver, you don't just get in your car, jump on the road and drive 200 miles an hour. So we do a lot of training on simulators. The manufacturer has simulators that are over $30 million. And I have a simulator in my home that I used to train on every single day. And this isn't just a video game. This isn't just something that allows us to, you know, look and see what it looks like to drive the track. These simulators are super advanced. So let's say we're going to my next race is in Florida. Um, I'm going to be on the simulator for hours every day. I'm going to be at the track in Florida. I'm going to be in my BMW M4 GT4 race car. I'm going to have the setup on my race car that I will actually have on the car in real life. And then I can change all the weather conditions. I can make it, you know, 24 degrees um, ambient temperature, 50 degrees track temperature, um, I can set the wind speed to six kilometers an hour coming northwest across the racetrack and set it so that it's overcast and there are four different types of race cars that race before me. And I'll go out and I will actually gather data on my simulator, right? I will um, go out, I'll drive five laps, I'll see how this car feels on this track, and then I'll come back in, I'll make a car adjustment. Let's say I add five degrees more to the rear wing. I'll go back out and I'll see how this change affected the car. And what we're doing is we're gathering data, data that's going to allow us to, when we're actually at the racetrack, when we have seconds to change something in practice, make the right change at the right time to actually head in the right direction with our race car. Because there are hundreds of things we can change on our race cars. We need to know exactly what each of these changes are going to do and how it's going to affect the car from an engineering standpoint and from a driving and driving style standpoint. The simulator is a huge part of the preparation and a huge piece of technology that really wasn't relevant five years ago. And then we use data to really help us prepare for every race event, right? Heading into every race, I'll look at onboard video from BMW drivers from previous years and myself from previous years to see what I did to go fast or what they did that allowed them to go faster on this racetrack. And then we'll dive into the data, right? Like I said, everything that happens in and around the race car is measured, is recorded. And I'll look specifically at driver data to see what was I doing or what were other BMW drivers doing in previous years that allowed us to go fast. And I'll take you guys through some of this data quickly to give you an idea of how advanced this data is and how we use it to get the most out of ourselves, right? So this is driver data. This is one lap of driver data from Watkins Glen International Raceway in upstate New York. I'll look at this before I get to the track every weekend 
And then when I'm at the track, after every practice session, qualifying session, race, you go and you analyze this data to make sure that you're heading in the right direction, you're driving the car properly, you're getting the most out of it, every corner, every lap, right? So I'll kind of explain what you're looking at and then I'll show you how we would analyze this when we get out of the car after a practice session or how we analyze it before we even show up at the racetrack. So the first thing you'll notice is there's a red line and a blue line. The red line is my fastest lap from this practice session. Or sorry, the blue line is my fastest lap from this practice session. The red line is the fast lap of my teammate from the same session. And all these different traces, they're all different sensors in the race car. So we've got the time difference. Whenever the red line goes up, my teammate goes slower or loses time to me. Whenever it goes down, um, my teammate goes faster or gains time on me. Then we've got the RPM of the engine. We've got the speed of the race car. We've got the gearing. So when we upshift, when we downshift, what gear we're in. We have the angle of the steering wheel. So down is right, up is left. We've got the brake trace. This is probably the most important trace we look at here. The harder you hit the brakes, the higher this line goes and the faster or more efficiently your car decelerates. And then we have the angle of the throttle pedal at every point around the lap. And so let's say we got out of a race car and we wanna know how we can improve. How can we make the car better? How can we drive the car better? What we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze every corner individually. Now we're zoomed in on turn one still the same two drivers, same two laps. And what we would do now is we'd say, okay, are we gaining or losing time here? Um, it says that I gain one tenth of a second on my teammate in turn one. And to give you an idea of how really precise you have to be and why this data is so critical, a tenth of a second is a huge chunk of time. Normally we're working in hundreds, thousands of seconds. Um, last year, at uh, one of our races, the top nine cars in qualifying were separated by two tenths of a second over the course of a minute and 45 second lap time. So for my teammate to be losing one tenth in just one corner is huge. I say, okay, you know, what am I doing that allows me to go faster than my teammate here? And you always go and look at the brake trace, right? In racing, time is always gained and lost on the brakes. Doesn't matter how fast you go on the straights, everybody's got their, you know, the throttle pedal all the way to the floor, but how do you decelerate? How do you slow down? How do you handle these corners? And so when I look at this brake trace, the first thing I see is that the red line goes up about three meters before the blue line. So my teammate is braking about three meters earlier than I am. So I'm accelerating down the strip for longer, gaining time. And then you'll see the blue line goes higher than the red line. I'm hitting 1,088 PSI brake pressure. He's only able to hit 944. So I'm hitting the brakes harder, slowing the car down more efficiently. And that allows me to get off the brakes earlier. So you'll see the blue line goes flat about 15 meters before the red line does. And there's a technique to braking you always have to think about when you're in the race car. Um, when you hit the brakes, you have the most energy in your brakes and your tires when you're going your fastest, right? So the technique is you want to hit the brakes as hard as you can, and then you want to slowly release your foot off the pedal. Because as you start to slow down, you start to lose that energy in your brakes and in your tires, and they can't handle as much. If you've seen a Formula One car, an Indy car, uh, a NASCAR going into a corner, and that tire isn't moving and there's smoke coming off of it. it looks really cool it's because they hit the brakes too hard for the speed that they're going they've overwhelmed that wheel and the tires stop moving and there's it's kind of dragging itself along the ground what you want to do is you always want to be right on the limit of how hard you can brake for the speed that you're going so you're slowly releasing off the pedal i've done a better job of this than my teammate and that allows me to get off the brakes earlier and gain time what hitting the brakes harder also does is it changes how your car is going to handle through the corner, right? So if you've hit the brakes really hard in your road car, you'll know that it lurches forward, right? All of the weight goes onto the front 
Well, it does the same thing in my race car. Hit the brakes, all the weight goes onto the front and the rear becomes almost weightless. That allows it to pivot or rotate into the corner. So by hitting over a thousand PSI, I've got very little weight on the rear of my car. It's really able to turn into this corner. When I get to the center of the corner, I've got a really good angle to get on the gas, drive down to the next point. My teammate hasn't hit the brakes really, very hard. His car's gonna be very flat, very stable. When he gets to the center of the corner, he's gonna have to wait for he can get on the throttle pedal. And cause he's gonna be pointed at the grass or the wall on the exit. So when you look at the very bottom trace here, you'll see that the blue line goes up about 15 meters before the red line. It's because I've got my car turned. I'm able to get on the gas. They're having to wait before they can go accelerate to that next corner. So that's what we have to think about every corner, every lap. And that's why this data is so crucial. You have to be so pinpoint accurate. You have to be thinking of the physics of the car you're driving. You have to be thinking of every little PSI of brake pressure, every kilometer an hour you're carrying into the corner, every foot of racetrack you're using. And obviously, you know, there are some tracks we go to that have 20, 25 corners. You can't memorize all these things for every one. So sometimes we'll go and we'll look at trends, right? Here we have turns four, five, six, uh, seven and eight. And in all these corners, what you'll see when you look at the brake trace is that the blue line is later and higher than the red line. I'm braking later and harder than my teammate in all these corners. I seem to gain in all of these corners. And so if we were going into our next practice session after this, you know, if I was my teammate, I would say, oh, it looks like Robert's hitting the brakes later and harder. That seems to be what this car and this track likes and wants. I'm gonna go do that in the next session in every corner. And then maybe we'll, you know, refine from there. So that's really how we're gonna use the data before every event, after every event, to get the most out of ourselves for that next time we're getting in the race car. But then, right, you actually have to go and race. You can look at data all you want off the racetrack. You can analyze brake traces, throttle traces, speed. But when the green flag flies, you're out in the real world, you have to be able to make adjustments on the fly. And everything around you is always changing. You can drive the perfect lap once, but when the track temperature is changing, the wind direction is changing, the tires, the brakes, the engine on your car is always changing. You have to be able to make adjustments on the fly. And there's really two ways you can do this. I have technology in my car that allows me to make adjustments to the setup of my car while I'm driving it. I can soften and stiffen the front and rear suspension. I can change the percentage of brake pressure to the front and the rear. I have engine maps, gear maps, throttle maps. Um, I have traction control map mappings, ABS mappings. I can change pretty much anything I want in this car while I'm driving it. And oftentimes this isn't enough and I'll have to adjust my driving style, right? Um, let's say it's lap one of the race, the tires, the brakes are cold. I'm breaking 300 feet into the corner or before the corner into turn seven. Well, when I come back around to turn seven on the next lap, I know I have a lot more heat in my brakes and my tires. I'll break 260 feet before the corner. And I'm not doing this for our lap to lap. I'm doing it corner to corner, right? If I'm breaking 40 feet later into turn seven, well, then I'll break, you know, 45 feet later into turn eight because you're always trying to be one step ahead of your race car. You're trying to predict what, it, what it's gonna do next. You can be as fast as possible every corner, every lap. You can't be reacting. You have to be making these adjustments ahead of time. And this is where the data comes in, right? I have a team of engineers, strategists, data engineers who are on pit lane, who are back in Germany and all of this data coming off the car is being fed to them. They're analyzing it on the, on the fly and they are relaying through my radio crucial information to me. This is how you need to be driving the car. It looks like the front right tire is doing this. It looks like, you know, when you change the suspension, you know, it's going to do this to your car so I can stay ahead of it. I also have 12 pages of information on my dashboard in front of me and I'll be taking in all of this data 
while I'm racing, digesting as quickly as possible and making these minute adjustments to get the last thousandth of a second out of every corner. And you have to do that with these millions of variables happening around you. Sure, someone who's quick, someone who has good you know, racing instinct can go and drive the perfect lap. But if you wanna drive the perfect lap every lap, then you need data and you need a really good team of people around you to support that, right? There's so much data that goes into going fast, that goes into winning races. And you see a lot of this data technology innovation, right? It's drastically changing in motorsports and you're gonna see that going into the automotive industry, right? Lots of the technology on our race cars are going to be implemented into road cars. That's safety, that's data and technology, that's technology that allows us to safely go fast, right? Um, examples are we have a, you know, unique headlights on our cars for when we end up racing at night. We have, um, you know, re the rear view mirror on our car. It's not efficient to just have a, you know, a, a mirror. We have a camera that points out of the back of our car that tracks every car around us. And if a car is approaching at a quick, uh, approaching quickly, it'll put a red arrow. If they're holding steady, they're in the same speed. It'll be a green arrow. It'll be yellow if it's somewhere in the middle. And that allows you to quickly take in all of this information that you're getting, right? And you're just gonna see more and more of what we're doing on the racetrack coming into you know what you're driving on the road every day. And then you think about innovation, you know, what's coming next? Um, I'm an, uh, an advisor to the West Point, Purdue, and MIT autonomous car racing programs. Um, autonomous driving technology is starting to make its way into motorsports. And in my point of view, it's doing that to allow us to drive these cars as quickly as possible. So much of what I do in the car could be done faster, more efficiently with an intelligent machine learning system. And there are gonna be huge performance gains in that. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was, we were racing at the 12 hours of Sebring. It's one of the most prestigious races in the world, one of the biggest sports car races in the world. And there was one car that qualified a full second ahead of the rest of the field. And that's unheard of. They were so much faster than everyone else, it was mind boggling. And when they went through technical inspection, it was found that they had technology in their car that was allowing the engineering team to remotely change the setup of their car while they're driving it, change the settings in the car without the driver having to do it. The engineers were typing into their computer exactly what engine mapping, trash control mapping, suspension mapping they wanted on the car for every corner individually. And that was a second in performance over the field. So when you think about, okay, well that's engineers, you know, typing in what they want from the car every corner. Think about if you had a machine learning system that cut out the seconds of adjustment that the human had to do, just how much of a performance gain that would be. As a driver, right? The only thing I want to focus on is turning the steering wheel, pushing the pedals, and passing the cars in front of me or keeping the cars in behind me behind me. And so all of this machine learning technology is just gonna give us such an edge over our competition. And you know, I wanna be at the forefront of that. And again, you're gonna see a lot of this technology from our race cars move down to the cars you drive every day. Um, when I, a lot of the work I do with West Point, um, they put a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of engineering into this program well, you know, the second highest cause of death in the military is vehicle accidents, right? They think that they can save a lot of lives by having autonomous driving technology in their vehicle convoys. So you're just gonna see more and more of this technology implemented into every day. And all this technology, right? Innovation, data, it helps us go win, right? That's the common goal here. As you know, driving race cars, it's very easy to see what our common goal is as a team. It's we wanna be on the top step of the podium. We wanna win every race that we do. Um, but you know, the goal of this innovation, technology and data as a whole, it's winning, 
but it's winning safely. It's, you know, being efficient with resources, with driving, with, you know, all of this, it's saving lives. And, um, you know, often it's going as fast as possible. So with that, that's all I've really had to talk to you guys about today. Um, I think there are some questions, but I'll hand it back to Sean, uh, who can kind of take it from here. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you. If I'm, um, Robert, what I find fascinating about your presentation is that this is all stuff that we, we don't think of, and we don't even think to think of, you know, because when we get in our cars, you know, we just kind of drive around or Uber, Lyft, um, Yandex cargo, whatever you're, whatever you're using for your transit. You just kind of get in, you step on the gas, you go, you're talking about going 200 miles an hour, reading 12 pages of, you know, whatever feedback, getting stuff spoken to you in your ear and making adjustments on the fly. And we're like, you know, um, it's a very different world. So thank you for introducing us to us. Um, so we do have some questions here. So I'll give you guys an opportunity to answer um, one of them. What do you propose to change the paradigm of personal transport in the light of dramatic climate changes? What small steps can we already do in this sense? So personal transit, climate change. Any thoughts on that? Okay, this is a, <clears throat> this is a tough one. So basically, uh, I've already mentioned that uh, one way of doing it is to change the propulsion. So if we popularize more Actually, if the Toyota's hydrogen engines uh, gain momentum in the public and uh, in the industry, this might be a way of reducing the uh, em emissions, uh, the gas emission, and this way we, it can uh, it can reduce the uh, the pollution. So. This is the, the fastest way that you can. And of course, with the electric vehicles, I, I think I also said there are pros and cons in the uh, for for the usage of this technology, because the technology for getting the, the batteries is a dirty one. And there is a lot of pollution which is generated by exploiting, for instance, lithium, which is which was until now the base component for the, the car batteries and of course the energy that is produced uh it's also questionable from where this produced electricity comes so the the fastest way for me would be to to actually uh try to change the propulsion to something which is not that uh polluting as as much as especially internal combustion engines sure. Um, here's one specifically for Robert. It seems like you get a lot of data off your car and that's fascinating. So the, the question is, do you, do teams also get this information about their competition or are you all sort of operating in a vacuum? You know what you're doing and you know what you can do to do better, but you don't know what the person next to you is doing and how they're doing. Right. Um, you get some information on your competition, but very little. You get some amount of lap times, you get some amount of straight line speed. So it'll give you a target to hit, but no, we aren't able to see how hard they're hitting the brakes or how they're setting up their cars. And so you kind of work in this vacuum, but there's so many variables in racing. There's so much outside of your control that if you want to perform well, all you can do is focus on yourself, mm -hmm. right? Um, all you can do is focus on yourself and know that, you know, eventually it's going to come back to you if you're doing all the right things. Um, but it's hard to do a sport where, you know, our last race in Daytona, we finished fourth. We almost executed that race perfectly. There was very little we could have done. And just the way the race fell, we ended up fourth. So sometimes that's frustrating, but... Um, but you just keep working with your team and we'll go, you know, win the next one. Another one for you, Rob. How do you and your management team keep up with racing technologies in your studio? You know, there's so much technology. I think it's all just open communication and working as a team, right? We have so many engineers and such a 
big, there's such a big focus on technology because that is what gives you the edge over your competition. So I think it's just staying informed, right? Like the work I'm doing with the, uh, with the autonomous racing programs, staying informed, knowing what's on the forefront of technology, because the things that people are doing, innovating in, I guess the real world, right? For everyday use that can come into, that can really come into play on the motorsport side and give you an edge over your competition, right? Um, I say just open communication and um, trying to challenge the status quo. You know, racing was a sport of, you know, just trying to go as fast as you can by the same means. And this technology is really kind of changing that and making it so if you can think and be smarter than your competition, you're going to beat them. Even. Can you explain the differences between autonomous driving levels, specifically the L2 and L3? Yeah, of course. So this is uh, 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 according to SAE. And basically, there's this is the, the first big jump towards the more autonomous cars. So the L2, in the, in, on the L2 level, you are still uh, required. Actually, L2 level still requires the attention of the driver and uh, you cannot take your eyes off. L3 is the level in which you should theoretically be able to take the eyes off the road uh, from uh, uh, while the, the systems are active. And uh, this is why uh, a lot of um, OEMs uh, develop an intermediary uh, level between uh, L2 and L3. So it's called L2 plus or extended L2 because their technological uh, capabilities surpass the L2 uh, uh, systems, but they uh, still don't wish to claim the L3 because uh, on, if you accept something on L3, then uh, the OEM is liable for all the damage uh, mm -hmm. that was done because it is uh, the state in which the eyes are taken off the road and the, uh, the, in this case, the driver cannot be held accustomed if something went wrong. So this is why we, we have this um, huge jump uh, between the L2 and L3. And that's the main difference, basically. Gotcha. And we've got one uh, for Robert, and I'll kind of merge these two together. So the first one is a little bit tongue in cheek. When we get AI drivers, do you think you could beat that? But if you look at the, the next question is, do you have an AI to help with the setup in your simulator, for example, to show time differences? Is there an AI to give you hints on which setup changes and when to make that? Or is it all just human ingenuity? That's like, well, we think if you did this, you know, but it might be interesting to aggregate all a lot of racing data and enable, like you had talked about machine learning to inform some of these recommendations. So where do you think AI has a role to play in what you do? Um, so it's funny because we've only just started playing with AI this year in setting up the race cars and it's been super interesting. And, you know, a big thing that it's done is it's taken away, you know, it's never going to be as smart as these engineers who have 20, 30 years of racing experience but it takes out so much of the busy work they have to do, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, building setups, writing sheets, figuring out, okay, for this weather, what do we do? Versus if it's 10 degrees colder, what do we do? And so that's been huge. It allows our engineers to just focus on innovation, right? Focus on what's really important, not on the nitty gritty mundane day-to-day -day things. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of beating the AI, the AI, isn't fast enough yet it just can't move as quickly as you know a race car driver so um around indianapolis um i was averaging 192 miles an hour or 194 miles an hour and the autonomous cars are doing about 130 140 miles an hour um so uh, right. you can beat it you can beat it for now anyway for now for now i think <laughs> i think i've got a I think I've got a job through my racing prime. After that, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, one last one, and then we got to go. Is race car driving ESG compliant, or or how do they measure this? Or 
do they care? Do the car companies, do the racing teams care? Um, e is it ESG compliant? Uh, I would say the fact that I haven't heard about it being yes or no probably means no, but there are lots of steps being made to make it, you know, as environmentally friendly as possible. Sure. Um, our tires are being made of more and more recycled material, I think in, you know, in the next decade, our tires will be 100% um, recycled materials and um, the fuel we're using is better and better for the environment. And what you're beginning to see is this switch from people are starting to find ways to make electric, electric and hydrogen racing quicker than combustion mm -hmm. engines. And so I think naturally, as we try and get a leg up on our competition, right? all the fastest race cars in the world right now are hybrids and we're mm -hmm. just going to head more and more to away from the combustion engine and towards what i think is going to be hydrogen racing in the next decade